Okay, yes, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Rugby Muscle Podcast. I'm, as always, TJ. Today, we've got something a little bit different for you uh, for this season. Hopefully, you're going to be doing quite a few of these. This is our first uh, interview of the new year and the new season. And this is with my good friend, a very well-educated, well-thought-out uh, and great coach, Colin Johnson, who used to be my captain when I was coaching community rugby at D2 level over in the States. He then took over the coaching of that team and we have been having continually, actually since I was the coach, a debate on the topic that you have seen before you clicked on this podcast, whether you should be doing conditioning slash fitness as part of your rugby training. And that's what we're going to get into today. And so without further ado, let's just not mince around, let's not beat around the bush. Let's get into this interview with Colin Johnson. I'll let him introduce himself. All right, mate, I've uh, hit record, so what you're going to do now is just to give a quick intro on yourself, your rugby, your coaching, whatever you think is pertinent to this conversation that we're about to have. Cool. Boom. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my name is Colin Johnson out here in Denver area. Um, been playing rugby for, well, 13 years now, and this is technically my second year coaching rugby. Uh, have a background in... American football and, and baseball played baseball in college and have done a bit of coaching at the high school level for that. Um, quite passionate about coaching and, and sports and the positive impact it has on, on your life and kind of those benefits to your well being. Um, and then I'm about to wrap up this semester, a, a graduate program, um, in positive coaching and ath athletic leadership. So it's pretty cool to kind of be able to learn some, learn some things and then have a platform to sort of uh, apply some of those new principles and and kind of dig a bit deeper on some of the, the research I'm learning about and, and again kind of try to implement that into into my practice it's interesting to get the <clears throat> like to go from just the coaching to like the academic sort of uh, point of view where it's like because a lot of a lot of coaching is also like by feel and it's just things that you think have worked before obviously where when we're looking at the field of academics is it a master of science you're doing so it's actually it's a master's of education um and uh, okay. so it's yeah, yeah yeah so it's designed for um i would assume here in the states kind of individuals who are already kind of in that coaching space just to mm -hmm. kind of upskill them and, and give them some more tools in their toolbox because a lot of people don't think about like you see that you see it so much in sport more than any other actually i guess in this age of the internet you see it in every area like people want to be coaches because they're good at a thing but coaching is a separate thing in itself right it's not just oh i was good at this this is how i was good at it you go do that and you'll be good at it and it's like how, like how do you teach someone to be 240 pounds if if they're just never going to have the genetics for it or how like how do you teach someone that's five foot six how to be a lock like you don't so then it comes into actual coaching expertise how to get through as well because there's obviously different players respond to different things so is that something that like is covered a lot in in what you did yeah you're you're spot on i think um you know the biggest thing to take from it is that you know you don't know what you don't know and you know, really, we're kind of limited to our own personal experiences and not only our own experiences, but kind of our interpretation of those experiences. So, you know, TJ's first year playing rugby, your experience might have been different than, you know, one of your teammates. Right. But you have the same coach, same training, but just your interpretation of the experience can be completely different. Um, and as coaches, like like understanding that every single one of your athletes you know, their background, their purpose for playing. Um, I mean, we're all so complex, right? So understanding that we all come from diverse and complex backgrounds, we're just different human beings. Like you have to have tools in your toolbox to try to connect and relate and make a positive impact on on different people, right? Like I remember, you know, playing American football here at 12 years old, like coaches screaming at 12 year olds like it just wasn't necessarily but that's like how they were coached right so it was the kind of the old school model so they didn't really know any better so i think you know for, for me that was that's been the biggest eye-opener for sure 
there's got to be a lot of survivorship bias with coaching as well like because the guy like if you if you want to create successful athletes you've got to make sure that you're keeping as many of them still playing so the ones that don't respond to that sort of like especially if you you take your american football example like the ones that don't respond to getting yelled at and getting screamed at quit but then the ones that do keep going and then they think okay that's what made me successful i'm going to keep and it's just almost like a vicious cycle right so you've got to figure out both ends of the spectrum because you you we're also getting a pushback almost the pendulum has swung so far back on the other way now where it there is compassion over everything and that's that's probably better than just yelling and screaming at everyone for sucking and even though they're trying their best and thinking that they just need to try harder but there is still room for something on the other end as well it's just and different people will respond to to different things i think that's like to me that's the most interesting thing about coaching right is is like not just your own plan and your own skills and and whatever you want to implement but how you get a squad of 30 plus people to implement them is fucking it's rough yeah man um <laughs> i think you know it, it the spectrum is is the right kind of language to use because you like the most important thing, and we'll probably touch on this, but like you want it, you need to be authentic as a coach because your players are going to sniff out if you're blowing smoke, right? Like if you're, mm -hmm. um, so, so like authenticity is key. However, like you have to be able to, and, and it comes down to getting to know your players and, um, kind of giving them some autonomy and how they want to be coached in the process of, you know, what do you need from me? You know, do you, like you need to get to know your players and, and understand like, mm -hmm. Hey, this particular athlete needs, needs a kick in the ass or, or might need a bit of, um, might need a specific style of feedback to motivate them. Whereas mm -hmm. other players might just need a, an arm around the shoulder and a, a get him next time champ type talk. Right. And so, yeah. but if, if you don't have the, the, the tools in your toolbox or the kind of the, the self-awareness or the skills to identify and then kind of choose, choose a hammer for the nail and a, a screwdriver for the screw, then you're, you're kind of yeah. you're failing. In, in my or opinion. even just awareness of the differences between those two things, because that's, I think that's 100%. huge. Because I have, I, I know, so, I remember a couple instances in my, my career where someone would want to scream at me and they knew that that's just not going to get a response. So then they'll talk to someone else and then they'll, they'll put the arm around or, or, so, you know, a good leadership. I mean, leadership is a, combination of people as well so if you get if you have good leadership you have those that recognize that uh maybe you do come down hard on them and then they recognize that and then they're they're offering you that they've give, been given that space to then give that arm around the shoulder instead and, and as you say um sort of meet them where they need to be met in order to to take in the information to get better um and i think this is where it's really hard though with, with rugby and with amateur rugby with such big squads, so many different things to work on. And what you, we were just talking about your, your training practice this, this season, you've got what, three hours a week, maybe three and a half hours a week to work on this. Yeah. yeah. And so this is where we're going to get into our sort of mini debate here. I want to give my stance on this. So I think with that in mind, I, it's so weird for me to say this, I think people don't like they find it amusing i even this is my view on this stuff because of what i do here at rugby muscle for my day job but i just don't think with that with four hours like maximum maybe four and a half sometimes if you if you're staying over and and wait until they shut the lights off and getting people mad because you're just staying at practice too late um that's just not enough time to to put any real emphasis on a conditioning focus and I think I'm of that mindset because that is when you've got four hours of rugby training, you've got line outs, you've got uh, scrums, you've got all the back set pieces, you've got kick chase, kick return, you've got attack, defense, in close, out wide, you've got the whole ruck situation, you've got more attack defense, you've got uh, set pieces in like kickoffs and stuff. And then you've just got open play, like what do you do with a three-on-three? Three? What do you do with a three-on-two? What do you do with slow ball? What do you do with quick ball? What do you do when 
you know, that someone rushes up on you and there's a dog leg? What do you do in defense if that happens? And solving that is not just a recognition of, oh, well, let's just work on this one time and now, okay, we've worked on our lineouts today, now we've solved them. No, you still need to practice them every bloody week to get them better. So with all of that stuff, you're still going to, in my view, you're still going to get enough of a heart rate response to potentially get some aerobic benefit. Particularly if you're doing a lot of live play, you're, you're most certainly going to get a good bit of condition benefit. I don't see the net benefit to be gained from doing extra fitness. Now, I know you're going to come at me with a, of a with viewing this picture from a different point of view. <clears throat> and funny enough, it was, and that's because when I was coaching, I did receive a fair bit of, I want to say negative feedback, but people didn't like it. I guess that is negative feedback. They didn't like the fact that we it's didn't just, do just fitness feedback. at Why training. Is that, it doesn't have to be yeah, positive yeah. or negative. It could just be feedback. I mean, it was, it was no, but if I don't like something, that I would class that as negative feedback. But yeah, I received feedback saying, hey, we we feel like we should be doing, you know, 10 minutes of sprints or 10 minutes of fitness at the end of a session. Um, and we feel like that is that is potentially not making us perform as well in games and i would still push back on that and maybe we'll get into why i'd push back on that um as we go but i think to to start a little back and forth i need to know what your stance is um just like in general or re relative to uh to respond my to sessions my view, now I and yeah, yeah yeah i have rule uh, yeah uh, um I mean, I agree with everything you say, and I think, you know, rugby is quite a, a complex game with, um, you know, a ton of uh, different situations and scenarios and, and you know, there's only so much time to get through all that stuff. Um, and then but my opinion and, and what I do with, with my team currently and, and what we did in the fall is we, we certainly did some conditioning at the end of each training. Um, I received uh, on the flip side, lots of positive feedback. Mm -hmm. I should, we should call it, or just feedback from the players about that. Um, you know, and, and I think there's certainly a debate for the actual like aerobic or, or biological benefit to 10 minutes of conditioning at the end of training. Cause similar to you and I kind of, uh, you know, piggybacking off of your style, we, we play a lot of rugby at practice. We do a lot of small sided games. We'll, we'll go into some, more large sided games with some constraints to promote certain behaviors or um, certain concepts that we're working on, whether that's trying to get the ball in the wide channels or, um, you know, playing with a bit of, of go forward. And, and that certainly gets the heart rate up. But what I've, what I've seen is um, it, it, it's funny. Cause I, I think the, the more you play, like the more experience you have, like you play smarter. So you're, you don't always have to work as hard. Right. So I think just because there's such a varying level of rugby IQ, especially at the level I'm coaching D2 men's club mm -hmm. rugby in the States, right? Like we have guys mm -hmm. with 10 years of experience, guys that have 10 minutes of experience. Uh, not everyone is getting the same aerobic benefit to the training session itself. Just the, the, yeah. the, the, the drills or, or the games that we're playing to try to promote some rugby based fitness, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's always the thing that I sort of push back on when people say about small sided games. And like, that's one of the big things. I mean, again, in academia for like uh, mm. team fitness stuff, it's all about small sided games because you want players to push themselves. You want to be involved. The reality is it's, like if you're just doing full length field tempo sprints or you're doing some sort of level conditioning drill for where they're all in a line, if, people can't hide, right? In a game, it's very easy to hide. Now, you said the more experienced you are, the more efficient you become and therefore potentially the harder you don't, you said you don't need to work as hard. I would say that's where I would come in and implement either rules or... I would just give coaching feedback and say, just because you don't have to work as hard, like, or, or just because you can get away with not working as hard because you're playing with newbies or you're playing with whoever, challenge yourself. You know, I think players should be, they're there to train, they're there to make mistakes, they're there to challenge themselves, and they should be putting themselves in situations where, um, 
and we've seen it with some of the other experienced players that would potentially show up once every two months, they would really push themselves. They'd be in position to take and they'd, they'd treat these games really competitively. And so I do think there's a there's a level of you setting the right expectations. But even if you do, some people will still invariably hide. How many props, like people listening to this will probably know when they play touch and that the props just somehow always end up on the wing. Why is it wherever you go in the fucking world, props always just end up on the wing? Like how, <laughs> Whenever you're playing touch, just always props on the wing. And they never do it in games because they know they're going to get exposed. It's, I don't know. Anyway, so I think, I do think that there is, uh, there is some merit to what you're saying about that. But then I would even potentially push back and say, if you are more experienced, if you are fitter, you need like then even the fitness that you're doing at the end of a game is going to have very minimal impact on on your uh you you you, you, you the way you're going to play a game or play matches on the weekend, um and potentially even and this is the problem I have I think where people they'll go into preseason they'll do some fitness drills and they'll do uh, you know, whatever emphasis on fitness they have during preseason, and then they'll get into the season, and, and three or four weeks into the season, they finally like aren't absolutely gassing every single game. The, the 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 overall feeling from these players is, oh, that's because I got fitter. I actually think it's because you adapt and you adapt your game more than you adapt your fitness, and you actually end up playing down because you now learn how to play with your level of fitness that you have. I don't think necessarily once a week, a game of rugby for 60 minutes, if you, if you're coming off, you know, into the second half is necessary. It's going to, it's going to give a good fitness stimulus, but what in three or four weeks, it's going to make a significant enough difference to, to really have that impact on your performance. I, I don't really believe that. I believe it's more likely that you're actually adapting your own game and and also like tactically doing better things, but also I think hiding when you can hide, taking your breathers when you can, not pushing yourself as hard as you possibly can. Yeah, it's it sucks because a lot of most rugby people consume rugby at the highest level, and so you know I think the pro game and international game they they have the ability to collect data. And so they're looking for certain markers and metri metrics, right? Mm -hmm. And so they condition their players that way. The players know what that feels like, what that looks like, what the expectations are with that. Whereas like social men's club rugby, like yeah, we don't really have that. And, and you know, there's been games where, you know, I thought I had a good game, but then like I 80 minutes of, of playing scrum half, I'm like, fuck, I don't, I don't feel very tired. Right. And then I've had other mm -hmm. games where I thought I had a bad game, but then I, I come off knackered. Right. And so, you know, again, it's all going to be relative to, to the competition to, to, you know, on that day, did we have a lot of go forward or were our, our backs scoring yeah. a lot of tries? Especially like, as a scrum it, half, right? Like, you, you, like in any position, I guess, but I'd say more so in the backs, it can be very much dictated by the type of game that you're playing, right? Hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, it's it's so hard to have like objective feedback related to that. And so, you know, maybe potentially an inexperienced or or, or someone might perceive, um, oh, that game wasn't that hard. As I must be getting fitter, right? Whereas it could have been a whole series mm -hmm. of other factors that right um but yeah i mean i think that's I, the I, other I think... hard thing about rugby right is that there are you've got the score you've got stats but even stats fucking lie a lot right because mm -hmm. if you play like a heavy blitz style defense you're going to get a lot of missed tackles that's because you're putting so much pressure on the ball carrier and you're getting them and you're forcing them back in and that's fine you know missed that's tackles by design actually that, for the most yeah, part exactly. yeah exactly yeah. so um, I, I don't necessarily even think it's that it's, it's like, there are some stats that you can, you can lean on, but there are a lot of stats that are just going to just be like everything else. They're dictated by the nature of the game. And, um, I think the end of the day, I, you know, 
I, I rationalized to myself about not doing the uh, like fitness testing because I feel like the waste of time. And, and since then, I've been really exploring, all right, what, what do we really need to, what can we really use as a measure of how successful a game goes? And I don't think there's anything better than like honest. And, and that's where it gets hard is making it honest but a subjective measure of how did that game feel how did you feel when you carried how many and you're going to get some stats in there but even that is like because sometimes you could get games where you you actually did loads of carries you didn't feel like you did that many and maybe that's because they're ineffective or whatever but i feel like the subjective measure of how well you feel you played how well you exerted yourself is as good as any because of the combination of so many different things because maybe if you got if you took loads of carries on it's because your team struggled to get over the gain line. Whereas if you only did a few carries, every time you broke the or you got over the gain line, you got your team front foot ball as a forward, went out to the backs and the backs did their thing. Like you've done your job. You don't need to do three carries in in two minutes to do your job. So it's it's really yeah. difficult to to nail down. You know. Yeah, you bring up a good point of. Um... You know, I think the, the qualitative data would be just as beneficial or as insightful as the quantitative data. You know, again, um, it's not like we're keeping that. <laughs> it's not like we're going back watching the film and we have a statistician that's tracking, you know, carries by our number eight that were over the gain line and meters gain and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like that's like all we really have to go for and, and, um, Really I do how... think the the videos are very useful. Just to push up, like just because we're, we're talking, about, we can do a little mini tangent. Yeah, yeah. The videos I think are very useful because that's a really good assessment. Then because you can watch yourself, because how you feel in the game is one thing, but then how you feel after you've watched yourself is another thing, and you can see, like, you can see, for lack of a better term, how not as good as you thought you were in your head. And I think that's universal. I don't. I don't think any. And it's because again, the rugby that you can relate to is is world class rugby or at least like elite rugby because that's what's on the TV. Like they're not showing like local club rugby, community rugby. They're not showing that. So you don't have a a perspective of what that looks like apart from you playing it. And so in your head you feel like oh I'm like the guys on TV. And then you watch it and you're like oh god I'm not like I'm so I'm upright I'm slow as shit. Like, why am I, I watching so these much? People. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why are my hands always on my hips and like things like that? And yeah, you're right. But I think that that's that's a real good way. Not even just to get the stats. It's actually a really good way to analyze where you can push yourself. And I think that's a really useful tool. Although I still, again, I think it's 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 as reliable as props going on the wing in touch you'll also just get people that watch the videos they look for their highlights and then they fucking that's it because <laughs> eight minutes is a long old match of rugby to watch even when they cut out all of the um the transition where the ball goes stuff, out of play yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. end up with like 40 minutes of ball, ball and play time <laughs> 35 minutes but even then yeah let's watch their own highlights but i think it's a useful tool but to go back to what you said about qualitative data i guess um we should we should touch on so we're in agreement that the the physiological fitness that you're going to get from the extra 10 minutes of fitness is going to be a potential to push guys that are coasting a little bit harder um it's not going to be as beneficial rugby wise because you know unless we're doing now there's no way of it being as beneficial rugby wise as 10 minutes of game stuff right so we accept that, but we take the trade off that it's 10 minutes of fitness work. It's probably going to at least make sure that everyone is working. That's a pro. But I think where you see the benefit is going to be more of the psychological thing. You got good feedback from from your players. What what did they say they enjoyed about it, I guess? Okay, so yeah, I'll use sort of their feedback and then I'll kind of go and then I'll just kind of share some of my sort of observations and insights and kind of reflections on that. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, they just said that they, they had felt better and they literally felt that it kind of made a difference into the game. Um, and, you know, again, we're just going based off of how they feel and that could be 
series of factors um you know them feeling better didn't necessarily translate into you know wins um mm -hmm. we we had some pretty good pretty good performances and um had opportunities and were in most games um but you know it's not like that extra 10 minutes went out there and won us matches right um but their perception is that that they felt better and so kind of what i'm curious and then i'll share what i'm curious about that sort of feedback from the players and then also share what i've kind of been observing the past two years mm -hmm. doing this or two seasons doing this so i'm curious if you know i'm not a psychiatrist um but like if, if there's a placebo maybe of when they are under fatigue or when they're feeling tired if if they can reflect on okay well i've been i've actually been doing these sprints whereas otherwise they probably wouldn't have let's just be honest like you know our team and our players are probably not mm -hmm. out running their sprints but if they can kind of they have that experience and can um you know refer back to hey i've been doing these sprints i can power through this like potentially that can give them some perceived maybe resilience to to fatigue um or at least a um some some positive sort of feedback to get back to to sort of put themselves in the i don't think i can do this but uh, you know i've got this type of mentality so i'm, I'm mm -hmm. curious to kind of continue to explore that and i'm 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 wondering how i can potentially get like collect some more detailed feedback on that but i think my observation is my observation has been um it's the most positive 10 minutes of, of our session and what i mean by that is it's the only thing our entire team is doing as one where there's not necessarily a there's not a ball in play it's not there's not a winner or a loser like when we do small sided games or touch games they're competing mm -hmm. against each other right mm -hmm. um and there, there's a winner and a loser or somebody's dropping a ball or fucking up and um with these sprints it's something it's the only thing we do for these 10 minutes like as a team and guys are super uplifting and, and pushing each other and there's a ton of of leadership and and sort of um you know some positive things being said and um like i can feel some teamsmanship developing from that and some camaraderie being built and so you know hopefully some trust in the process is being built through through that um so that's just kind Leadership. of what i've been yeah 100 percent. like that's yeah. kind of what i've been what i've been observing um so yeah that's why i i, I say more so than the, the the physiological benefits but the i think there are some some psychological benefits that come with those 10 minutes I think that leadership and like there's like a level of accountability as well. Like everyone has to do it. Like no matter, mm -hmm. like I, I remember when we used to do some of the sprints and there'd be like one, there'd be one guy who was at least, I don't know, he was at least 130, 140 kilos, uh, like mostly second or third team player. And he'd do the fitness of everyone else. And like, instead of doing mm -hmm. sprints, it would just be a, like a slow jog. But everyone would be fucking like clapping there. Come on, mate, go finish it off. And you, and there's also a level of leadership where the fit ones get it done, and they're like, "Cool, like come on, everyone." And they start encouraging, and and that does, I'm sure that creates a a level of, level of leadership. So I have got a couple of responses, um, from what your I guess it's your reflections, but also their reflections as well. My first one is thinking, well, you took over the team from me that I like I say I already received the feedback that they want, that they felt like that they were missing doing fitness in training. So do you think there's a level of they feel better because that was what they wanted to do anyway? You know what I mean? Like, so they've come to train, like they've come to training to knowing that they, they wanted to do some fitness work. You've then given them that fitness work and they've, they've, they've ha allowed that to, to, I mean, they've enjoyed it because that's what they wanted to do, you know, whether I don't know whether that really reflects on how they felt in games or just how they felt in general overall, which probably does then have some trickle down effects to games. It most definitely does. Yeah, yeah, I, I think. Um, yeah, I'm a yeah, I, I think I'm a big believer in, in some autonomy. Right. And so 
you know, we'll get into kind of the role of the coach a bit later on, I'm mm-hmm. sure. So I don't want to get weeds there, but um, yeah, without a doubt, it's, it's given them a bit, bit of ownership. Um, you know, they have some skin in the game. If um, it, it probably signifies to them that I trust them um, and giving them, yeah, an opportunity to, to sort of, Put their stamp control on them. Yeah, what the team are doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would push back on that autonomy a little bit and say I would give them the autonomy to go and do their fitness and their sprints and whatever physical conditioning work they would need outside of like outside of my four hours that I would have them a week or three or four hours that I'd have them a week. Like I, in my opinion, would, I view that as more autonomy than, than, than anything. I'm saying like, Hey, you're coming to rugby training. We're doing rugby, right? We're doing like, you want to do fitness? Great. Excellent. You've, you've got to go do that in your own time. I'm letting you do that whenever you want, however you want. I'm not making you do fitness. If you don't want to do fitness, that's fine as well, you know, but you're going to suffer when we play rugby. Um, I find that you, 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 you mentioned, you know, that they've put in that harder work um, in the training. They felt that they did that sprints that maybe that helped them in the games that they felt like they'd gone to that, you know, they pushed themselves hard. They felt like they'd put in some extra work and therefore um, had more confidence in themselves in games. Again, why can't that happen outside of training? And maybe just because these players are lazy. Uh, I, You know, to which... Like maybe that is maybe maybe that is the point. That is the point that most people aren't listening to this podcast, Colin. You know that's that's a fact. So are we only like ha, ha, who, are you holding the people that aren't lazy back by accommodating for the ones that are? Because the ones that already are have already done that fitness work, and you know have even less impact from this extra ten minutes of fitness. And it's also not a a zero sum game where well sorry it is a zero it is a zero sum game sorry it is a zero sum game where right if if you're doing 10 minutes of fitness twice a week that's 20 minutes that we could have been spent nailing our lineups or nailing our set piece and you say when you go into games well they want that feeling of um sound really hostile here it's not you say that like you're a fucking idiot it's just to counter this argument right i would say well if you've spent an extra 10, 15 minutes laying in a lineout, you've got it, you're really confident in that. That is, if you go into every lineout knowing that you're going to nail it and your backs can then have that confidence, that has a huge impact on games. If you, you, You've been in games where you can't win a fucking lineout, it's a disaster. It doesn't yeah. matter how fit you are, you can't even get going. So there is always going to be something that gets that gets pushed out and is is not trained at all because you cannot do lineouts if you're not training or unless you've got a highly autonomous group that meet up, you know, five forwards, you need at least probably five to make it worthwhile to do any sort of practice. Like that just doesn't happen. And if that does happen, then why they like, you get my point. Then we're, then we're all talking a level of commitment that would be covered with fitness outside of training as well. Um, yeah. It, you know, um, we're, we're a pretty unique, or this is a pretty unique, or maybe it's not, I guess it, in that we have players on our team and people who live in rugby playing nations probably won't even be able to quantify this, but we have, we have players that live 25 plus miles away, miles away from the training ground, right? And we, we encompass this entire area stretching from Fort Collins to Denver. Um, Mm -hmm. And so like the fact that they've turned up at all, it it is a massive win. And what's the, what's the longest commute to rugby training? Probably about an hour and a half. Fort Collins for Taggart. I would think. Yeah, probably that. Mm -hmm. And that's probably not quite an hour, probably hour, hour 15. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people will make that level of commute anywhere you think something like that yeah, you know, maybe not know. just yeah. for rugby but like 
they'll make that commute for work for and work then and then just maybe they play rugby for training yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah anyways yeah no, but yeah no, fair but, enough so but it's still a big yeah, commitment so, right yeah yeah 100 percent. and guys again if we talk about like their purpose for playing um there are i've talked to players who play rugby for the physical nature of it but strictly mm-hmm. for the physical like their physical engagement with the game itself not outside so they literally they're they're they like use rugby phys- as like they, a means of fitness tuesday thursday saturday or their training is is what they do physically for their body right yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah, yeah. And, and, and so again like you're never going to be able to meet the needs of every player um and for me, unfortunately, selfishly, it's about controlling the controllables in this particular situation. And if I had the opportunity to like ensure that the guys that show up to training got, you know, 20 minutes of extra fitness and potentially a bit of team bonding out of the out of it, then I'll take it. Um, because as we've seen over the years, if we it's out of our hands right um and so you know i'm choosing to um kind of i guess take the 20 minutes of fitness over maybe having a a bit of line outs that are that are better or um, nailing down some some strike moves with the backs that are a bit cleaner or or more does that always is that always the one that is that always what gives the way or is it also you could be doing just games in that time uh no so i, I think well it, it depends and, and things are going to change once we start playing matches right i think mm-hmm. you know we're going to dedicate time to things that we are struggling at right so our performances are hopefully going to inform our training sessions and we'll, we'll probably be playing like er, these first couple weeks so we don't play we're supposed to have a kind of an intro squad on the 30th. So we got a couple weeks, but um, we're just going to be playing a lot of rugby, getting guys back into it. Like we're not doing any tackling or, or mm-hmm. breakdown work, right? We're just, you know, doing some install shape and communication stuff so that when we get into the games, guys can actually make some calls with confidence and we, we are running some type of, of shape and, um, you know, working on those things. But um you know, I think once we get into the season, we'll certainly do less game based. There'll, there'll still be some, but to your point, like shit, man, we're gonna have to. We have a whole lot of other things to work on, um, and so the the yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's it's it hard, right? It's, there is yeah. so much. It's it's like a fascinating continual pro- like it's a problem that's hard enough to solve for professional teams. Mm. You know that like. Like you saw uh, Ireland's line out, I think, on the weekend, last weekend, like just went, got torn apart by England. The, like, you think they need time to train more line outs, or do you think they don't have enough time to train line? Potentially, because, <laughs> like, but there's just, there's, they only had, a, they only had, oh, they would have had two weeks even as well, because they had the week off as well to prepare for that. And it was still not enough, because they still couldn't nail it in the game. So it's like, it, there is never going to be enough time, I guess. So you always accept, you accept that fact. You, cut, and you, you, you choose you your hill to that, die on. Right? I think it sounds yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, so yeah, going back to the um, the games, and the, so your hill to die on, for the purposes of this debate, is going to be the fact that the fitness increases. Uh, aspe- like that team bonding that psychological thing is the real thing that you're leaning into that you think isn't done with small sided games any other t- such rugby preparation right because it's not we've already kind of I think correct me if I'm wrong agreed on the fact that the uh, outside of people being able to hide potentially in games and stuff we've agreed that it's not necessarily going to give but particularly because I don't think you're you're putting them through a grinder i think you're just doing tempo sprints of them right so it's fairly aerobic it's not going to give them yeah, any, necessarily imam, any great tempos, benefit uh, yeah it's not going to give them any great benefit over doing you know some level of small side of game conditioning wise but you believe that there's a psychological aspect and a, and a team building aspect that doesn't come 
and one of the arguments that you said was because when you play the small sided games there's always like a winner or a loser and there's like there is that sort of uh i just i guess confrontation and battle against each other from two sides of the team do you feel that that still that you still don't get the the camaraderie of each team together and obviously if you're continually switching out those teams because you're not going to play the same two teams every single week right but guys are going to switch in switch out so everyone's going to get a, a decent level of experience on everyone else's team do you not feel like there's still going to be enough uh camaraderie and, and and togetherness built with that sort of stuff and if not or either way have you also ever played with when you're doing like small sided games or you're doing skill development like under pressure so it's not just unopposed but done it so in in a fashion so that you've dictated who the drill is designed for, right? So if we're doing a defensive drill and we're trying to work on our blitz, we're making sure that the attack knows that this is done to to train the defense, so the attack aren't You're really trying fail to win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The attack aren't yeah. really trying to win. They're trying to help their team get better by working on the defense. Therefore, they're not really against each other. Yes, they're playing opposite sides, but they're not really against each other. Do you ever do any of that? Yeah, good question. We did that uh, actually tonight. Um, we put some constraints on on a touch game um, to kind of promote a, a blitz defense and prevent teams from getting the ball into the wider channels. And so there was like a designated sweeper on the defense who could make... Mm -hmm who is the only person who can make a tackle into that 15 meter channel to really promote um, kind of that line speed in the midfield and sort of, you know, bringing in that blitz and rush defense. Um, and there are, we, we run into this issue every year with, with kind of touch games or, or thud games where players will adapt and, and regardless of what we tell them or what we tell them the purpose is like players try to win the game instead of like applying the rugby skill or or tactic that we're working on right okay. so we'll, we'll get into a game and, and players will will do things to try to to win the game <laughs> versus like that's not you're really you're doing offload touch doing and all of a sudden someone's doing a crossfield kick or something yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Know, exactly. It's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows these people. Yeah. And, and again, I, I think, I mean, to, to, to be perfectly honest, like, I, I don't know. I think it, it could work. Um, we, we've had quite a bit of turnover the last couple of seasons. And so, um, you know, I'm still kind of learning the players and, and learning how they, Kind of react and respond to adversity in some certain situations um again guys brand new to the game you throw them in a small-sided game they're not really going to know what's going on and it's mm -hmm. a quite uncomfortable situation for them which is a positive thing and gives our leaders an opportunity to coach them up and make them feel comfortable but again i think just with the sprints it 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 takes away all it's of a lot the, more basic right it, it takes away all more, the noise man yeah, like there's no yeah, more interference yeah, yeah. there's no more interference um yeah this is your and, job and, this is what you got to do yeah yeah and, and and again it's 10 minutes right so if we if we take 10 minutes we're probably taking you know three minutes from a touch game two minutes from line outs two minutes like so it's not like yeah, yeah. something is completely being sacrificed for this it's just we're taking a little bit of of a few things to kind of make up make up this 10 minutes but it's um it's an interesting way to like just make it simple but then that is everyone can encourage everyone and everyone knows their expectations is i do this and i finish and i run to this yeah. line and that's it or i run between these lines or whatever um i mean yeah and especially when you've got different even if it's like clubs all around the world might not necessarily have completely inexperienced guys but they'll have different levels of player all playing like all at the same training session as well within the same team and there is that element of 
because one guy gets really competitive, you know, maybe that maybe they because it gets so competitive they never give it to the new guy or the bad guy or the bad guy makes a mistake and all of a sudden he's being screamed at and he doesn't even know what he's done wrong. <sighs> but I also still think that is still preparing everyone for for games. Um, I, you know, I I still think that there's an element of that is and also an element of like when it gets really confrontational with two teams against each other that isn't even necessarily a bad thing i'm not saying you said it was but i want to point out it's like that can be a really good thing if you get so if your will to win in training is is real high and you you know it get you know testosterone starts flying around people get in each other's faces every, both teams really want to win they start taking it really seriously and and they start getting pissed off at each other like that's a competitive environment that's not a bad necessarily a bad thing and i think you could even lean into that as a coach and say look look at how bad we want it like we're going against each other we're only playing a team whoever you know on on the weekend if this is you you're doing this against each other imagine what's going to be against actual opposition there's ways to lean into that no spot on and i i there's a term called positive tension, right? And again, it's kind of preparing yourself nice, yeah. for these game scenarios and, and sort of um, tense, stressful situations. And how do we solve problems together when adrenaline's high, emotions high, you know, like how do we get our, like how do we, you know, what is our framework? What is our, our process for solving these problems? And um, I, I love I love a little bit of niggle in training, man. Like we, you gotta have it. Rugby because it's going to happen in games, right? Fucking confrontational. It's, it's, it's going to happen game. in games. You're going to have to get your emotions messed up in a, in a game, and then you have to figure out a way to carry on doing what you got to do. 100%. That's and again, that would be my pushback, I guess, to to then this fitness thing. Particularly now, this is I'm going to almost contradict myself massively here, <laughs> but I think I know where I'm going with this, like. If you're doing fitness and now you've accepted, okay, well, it's, you know, you know, I mean, we've worked together for a while. So, you know, rugby's fueled by the aerobic system, blah, blah, blah. You When you're doing the conditioning, you want the conditioning to be mostly aerobic. You want it to be aerobic because that's going to give them the best benefit on game day. However, it's not that difficult, right? Would you not, like, it's, you know, yeah, 50 meters, 60 meters at most on the minute. You're coasting through. You should. You, you know. You're not trying to do max sprints. Um, there's going to be potentially a little bit of fatigue there, but it's just mostly just happening into the aerobic system, so it should be fairly, fairly low intensity. Would it not be if you're doing this for the benefit of you know each other, put uh, your teammates pushing each other, um, having that feeling of oh, we've gone to a really hard place? If we're also acknowledging at the same point of view that we're not getting the physiological benefits that are going to make a huge difference would it not be worthwhile to accept that and then maybe go even further and do some sort of like lactic um drill where it's like you know 40 seconds on pushing yourself as hard as you can and i've already got my my own response to why this wouldn't work but <laughs> or why this might be wrong um yeah, you know, or maybe like real short rest periods, put them through like a, a proper grinder where they do have to, it's not aerobic. It's They're going to have to suffer. They're going to have to get through it if they want to perform it at, at any level. Why would you not go all the way and like really push them? I mean, maybe even say like they do some sort of broken bronco or some sort of thing like that. Um... Yeah, re re really good question. I think probably because deep down I know how ineffective that would be. But I think, again, if you're looking for strictly the psychological benefit, there's certainly an argument of of going through a, a meat grinder with your teammates and, and sort of suffering Is there? through that. Um. Because you got to get that balance, right? Because I, I, that was that would have been yeah, my yeah. argument against it. The same people that are hiding in games are probably going to be the same people that aren't really going to push themselves as hard 
doing the broken bronco and they're just going to do enough to get through even accepting being at the back of the line you know yeah and, and and i mean there's like again if you're there's research out there regarding mental toughness right and i know you're big on the train you're either trained or you're untrained right and, and the research is coming but, out even more and more to sort of prove that right 100 percent, and i i think for and and this is the extreme we're talking the one percent of the one percent like olympic gold medalists in like swimming and cycling and stuff right like they push themselves to limits that the like their opponents just won't go or they perceived that they won't go um mm -hmm. and then that gives them sort of that affirmation or that confidence or that self-belief to go out and win a fucking gold medal right um so like there is science out there for the elite elite performer that like if we're looking at you know mental toughness and how do we define mental toughness if it's you know just self-belief or an ability to perform in high pressure situations like the feedback from the athletes in these in in this research was like like yeah, being mentally tough is being able to push yourself really 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 effing hard right mm -hmm. um but i don't think that would we're not elite level athletes right and so i don't think we need to take you know our, our players to necessarily that that place and in regards to you know the the people that are going to hide um again you're never going to be able to check all the boxes for every player right mm. but if i can do what needs to be done for 70 percent of the players like that's a, that's a pretty big chunk of the team right and the other 30 percent that might not be getting that similar benefit or either not pushing themselves how they should be or maybe they already get do all their fitness on the on the side and so they're not getting the benefit um that somebody who doesn't do any fitness is getting mm -hmm. um or per perceiving to to get but then maybe they get that that benefit of like you say the affirmation of oh look i've been doing this fitness work outside of training and now i'm, at and the I'm front burning of everybody yeah, yeah yeah i'm at the front of the back rows or i'm the front of the team or oh i'm a prop and i'm keeping up with like that's the one i get used to get i get a lot actually with all the props I'm working with, they're like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping up with the back rows doing the fitness stuff. And then that makes them feel good. And then that may probably, I don't know if that makes them even, like, even if that makes a difference in the game, or just the fact that they're physically fitter in the games anyway. Um, I also so, think uh, what the, the, the one problem I would have with the redlining, well, actually two problems. Number one, I think if you do redline them just for the sake of it, I think you push some guys too far and rather than feeling good about themselves they feel they feel like shit you know <laughs> and and it does it, it, like they especially if they don't actually push themselves as hard as they know that they should they'll know that and they'll know that they sort of wuss it out and and probably because they're just not fit enough to to push themselves that hard in the first place you have to have a level of fitness like you said with the the olympic gold medalists they took themselves to places really like push themselves unbelievably hard to win or to train to that level but they're also really fit and really physically competent in the first place to be able to push themselves that hard so if you've got taking a population that aren't already physically conditioned and now we're redlining them we're, we're asking for disaster and not even yeah the ones that they are tra they right. are trained to take themselves to that level social right. rugby players are not yeah. and the and the ones that um are doing their fitness there are doing their gym outside now what we've potentially done is put them to a level of fatigue where we're going to hold whatever hold them back from whatever training they might have had planned the next day and or, and or the day after that so i do think i wouldn't push it it was just worth entertaining the idea of okay well if we're doing this for a mental benefit like why not go full fucking goggins and i i wouldn't do that it was just a it was just a thought that I had as to well if we if we're not doing it physiologically where yeah can no take there's it? certainly merit to that argument um but yeah I mean and also the other argument I would have for it is the main way you're going to do that to push people like where they have to dig deep 
means that they're going to have to work for periods of probably longer than 20 seconds, like really, really, really hard. And that just doesn't happen in rugby. So even if you do, you have the resolve. Wow, look how hard I push myself for three or four minutes here. That's not a skill that transfers to rugby because every mm. action is 10 seconds. Maybe you have an, an intense period where you, you're going for 20 to 30 seconds at most just because you're going from ruck to ruck or you're, you're doubling up on a, on a play or something. But not really. And most of it's just 10 seconds and then you're, you're recovering to get ready for the next one. So that skill of, oh, I can dig myself really deep over a period of two to three minutes doesn't, great. It doesn't fucking help you in a game of rugby. Even mentally, I don't think. So yeah. Um, all right. Before we, mate, we're, we're already closing in on an hour on this. Um, what I want to know from you is, I guess with all of this stuff, we, we've agreed on a few things. We've disagreed on a few things. I think it also comes down to the role of a coach, right? And and how, I mean, how many different ways that you could take that off? What do you view, I guess, you can't even just answer that. It's just like in one sentence. But what's the best way to view the role of a coach in, in like uh, community level rugby? Like, what is your job as as a coach? Okay, so just not as a, of a coach in general, but specific to my. Hey, you my could do a coach role. in general. Yeah. Or would your would uh, your role as you differ from other coaches then? And how would that? It, so it's just more specific, right? So I think, like, for, I think just generally, um, in my opinion, the role of a coach is to help the players achieve their goals individually mm -hmm. and that in and collectively. Right. And so if I transfer that into my role here as a club level rugby coach in the Boulder community, it's, um, you know, our men's team sets goals for every season. So helping them achieve those goals and whether that's performance goals or recruiting and retention goals, like what can I do as coach to facilitate an environment or provide an environment that helps them achieve their goals. Um, but also we have the, the club as a whole from the, you know, the Boulder rugby football club where we have youth high school women's teams, um, like we're, we're quite a robust community. So, you know, also ensuring that I'm kind of upholding the, the values and, um, sort of expectations set forth by, by kind of, I guess what you would call our governing body or our, our, our board of directors, if you will. Um, but I, I think, you know, at its foundation, a coach is, is there to help the players themselves achieve their goals. Um, I mm. think a big issue that I see in, in sports in America and predominantly youth youth and high school sports is this projection of coaches' egos or perception of success um, where, you know, they're kind of, devaluing the experience of the, the participant. Um, and, you know, I think if your whole purpose for, for, for playing is to win, you're going to be disappointed far more often than you're going to, you know, be fulfilled. And, you know, when you, and, you know, speaking of turning players away from participation, like that's, that's a recipe for, for, mm -hmm getting players to go play fucking video games or pick a different sport to play. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think, you know, good coaches, um, good coaching, you know, allows teams to, to overachieve and bad coaching allows bad teams to overachieve and bad coaching can have really good teams underachieve, but a team overachieving can be going five and 10 and a team, a team underachieving can be going 10 and five but who's viewed mm. as the more successful coach, right? Mm. Um, so again, I think it's, it's much deeper and, um, you know, more kind of values-based, um, ethos-based, morals-based than it is anything else. It's like, um, I think of it as terms of winning is always one of the goals, but it's only one of mm. the goals, you know? It can't be and the, the fact goal. Is, yeah. yeah, and the fact is, Every weekend, 50% of teams lose, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, not, not quite because you got draws every now and again, but fucking 
you get my point. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. <laughs> but like, even even a draw is not winning, right? So you could you could say yeah, even more. Yeah, don't, yeah. yeah, don't win. Yeah, that's true. And it's like yeah. the goal is always going to be to win. Like, I, I, you think how many competent competent professionals were at the World Cup, and and ninety five percent of them lost. You know, like ninety five percent of them failed. Mm-hmm. So. It's 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 just one of those things where you can't make that the only goal. So you, you have to you have to have things to fall back on that you say, okay, this is still a success no matter what. Because if you sacrifice everything to win, I feel like even that win will be fairly unfulfilling because of because you've just got nothing else. I think that leads to very flawed people. I mean, you can look at professional and elite level athletes or elite level performers in any field that seem to you envy them in that one field but then you look at the grander scheme of their lives and you think oof I actually wouldn't want to trade places with that person and I think that's where the role of the coach becomes a a bigger thing and I think um, there is there is more to winning but at the same time like you say representing the philosophies that you've been given uh, representing I guess the the um the not the philosophies the uh what's the word i'm looking for here values you know that's probably one of the most important things um so i think it it all ties together whether i th- i still think you uh, you you said it at the start authenticity still has such a huge role within that and i think um there's there's roles for authentic people of all different personality types um leaders etc to still make great coaches and there's also room for all of those leaders to still be playing games as well and i think a good good coaches aren't necessarily always just coaches good coaches can be also players that are given autonomous or autonomy and lead as part of the team um and I think we're seeing that more and more with rugby with, you know, people that have come into the game now where it's, I mean, you don't get anyone now in, in the modern professional era that has just, or the modern era of rugby that that just relies on those old school values that, and old school ideals that just don't exist anymore in the game. So... What do you think? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. What do you think is the most important skill or attribute of a coach? It's, you know, I'm going to say, unfortunately, uh, this is the default answer to every question that I ask as a coach, but it is the right answer to this question. It's communication. And I think effective communication combines everything together right so if you like i feel like you can do whatever you want if as long as you communicate your ideas effectively and i feel like potentially that's probably one of the that's probably the the reason why i got the pushback i did when i didn't do any fitness with 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 our lads was because when i was doing that I don't think I communicated well enough my complete reasoning and they're still like, yeah, but why aren't we doing this? Whereas, you know, I've just spent fucking an hour here explaining to you why I don't think it's a good idea. Um, and that's, on, that's on me because it was my job to win them over. Whereas your job or you, you were coming at it from them saying that's what they already did. So you just gave them what they already wanted to do. That's great. Whereas if I communicated more effectively they may have understood more. They might have not. I mean, actually, no. If I, if I communicate really well, they should always understand. Like that's, that's the whole thing about communication. You can always get your way around allowing people to... And it's, it's, um, it's, like, it's influence, it's manipulation, but it's not necessarily negative. It's getting people to see things from your perspective and then therefore doing the things that you want them to do for the reasons that you want to do them. There's no, there's no like, um, slyness in that, you know, 
it's in it's influence and leadership is influence mate like 100 percent. so yeah it's not manipulation in a negative way i think communication certainly is is um a lot like a skill lacking in a lot of coaches um i always my, my belief and and this is more of a cop out just because it can literally mean an infinite amount of things but like i, I think self-awareness um yes I was going to is, say is empathy big, as well. Yes. So again, you can't have good communication skills if you don't have self-awareness, right? Like if you don't That's self-awareness, uh, right? And, and, and empathy comes with self-awareness as well. Like, so mm -hmm. I think, you know, self-awareness is kind of foundation to, again, authenticity, to empathy, to communication, um, to, to coming up with values. Um, like you need to know who you are, what you stand for, um, to have actually implement values and set goals right so but Would again you say that's, it's the it's, same thing not just to be a coach but to be coachable as well um so i think the, the hardest reality that a lot of coaches and this is again just my perception and kind of what i see is the role of a coach is to eventually become like not not needed to become yep. redundant right and so that's a really hard thing for the the ego of the coach um and so it's never, but it, it shouldn't be because it's never going to get to that point you know right what I mean? but but I, that I think should to, always to be point. the end goal but the all blacks are still yeah. going to always have a coach it's, but it should be that should be how well this team should operate correct um, and, and to, I, had a, I, had a, I had a coach coach sorry i'm gonna have to yeah. we're gonna go one hour and ten now anyways um, I had a coach, coach who who didn't show up to a session, and like, or he showed up, but he like hid in the bushes. Um, I think I've just said to this see what you guys would before. do, just to see. I I wasn't there for it. It was, it was a, a few other teammates. It was a different team, but yeah, I think they were gonna fuck around and they were like not doing anything for the first thirty minutes, and then they did get themselves together and like the leaders stood up and they you know they got they did some unopposed, they did some drills and stuff. But I feel like that's so cool. Can you imagine like the risk of not just not showing up. Um, but yeah, it's hundred percent like that is, but that is like, I, and I've always toyed with the idea of doing it. I just never had the guts to, especially, I, I don't know if that's ego as well, but it's not because I was like, I'm being paid. I should. Like, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's hard to no, excuse. Still, still pay me for the session. This isn't, yeah, this yeah, isn't exactly. exercise. This is still this coaching. Is no, it's still yeah. coaching. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I totally agree. And, but I think to be coachable, I think it's also self-awareness to be like 100%. it's it, and unfortunately like i think that's where i went to communication because you've got to commute as a coach sometimes there are some people that you have to communicate so well with in order for them to get a level of self-awareness in order to be coached because some people will just project 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 they think ev like some people think every solution is hit rucks harder or do that you know or just work on set piece or everything is we've got to just do fitness and you're like mate you lost by you were losing by 60 points in the first half yeah but i think if we just did fitness at training then that would have been better this isn't a specific example of course this is just uh hypothetical yeah, yeah, yeah. like that would yeah, yeah. be the idea right <laughs> yeah. that, and people are like this and so again that's where i came with communication is well you've got you have to really communicate with these individuals in order for them to see that now a lot most people listening to this are going to be players athletes so i think that's that's where I, I think how can you look at yourself and see you know don't watch videos and see your highlights how can you look at yourself and actually genuinely see where you can go better and actually annoy coaches in order to because a coach wants to help you it's funny, loads of people will say to me, you know, oh, I don't want to bug the coach. I don't want to be annoying. I'm like, coaches will love it if you come up to them and you ask them more and more questions. And the worst case scenario is they do get annoyed at you, but they get annoyed at you because you care so much. And so that's a good thing. Or they're a shitty coach and they get annoyed at you for potentially challenging them and their ego gets hurt. That's also great because then you found out that that coach sucks and you either should move team or you just know how to play him better. But even then, I think... You, you should communicate with them as well. So again, empathy, uh, self-awareness, communication. I think those, it's, 
the great the most important traits of being a good coach but also being coachable um that and doing fitness outside of training because then you've got so much time to <laughs> because Somehow you've got so much we, that, we that now back, yeah. everything has opened everything has opened up and you've got all this time now you don't have to worry about fitness you already know like you've got that mental edge because you've been putting in the work and you can just train really hard and and work on all of your skills set pieces and everything else that is involved in rugby and you can be a proper leader and even if your coach decides that you've got to spend 10 to 20 minutes or even an hour doing fitness within your training you're also really prepared for that and now all of a sudden you're becoming more and more of a leader coaches will notice that they won't necessarily pick you if you suck at rugby but you're at the front of the line in fitness drills but you're going to be noticed and you're going to be performing better so yeah yeah i mean i, I i'm a, a huge advocate like you know I, you you saw it i think i certainly enjoyed the game more and my performances um kind of showed what what you can do when you get your body in right nick for for rugby or at least in better nick yeah so you had your, you had your best season right yeah um you had your best season and then you retired my my, you my turn you left in the Jay, tank mate <laughs> that's true yeah i was out you're like, I, you're I was like running, george st pierre or uh, <laughs> I was, richie mccall i ran i ran tempos with the boy to with the boys tonight so still got a little bit but, oh yeah um I mean, we're nice. just the, you know, how the, the attrition goes. Um, I'll certainly, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll have to get, mix it in a little bit, but scrum half's easy, man. Like it's, especially if I'm coaching, like there's, yeah, it's like, it's like I won't be also, as, you know, Richard, Riggle, R- Richard Wigglesworth, like yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. he was basically the coach when he was his last couple of seasons. For Lester. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. He was basically the coach. And I don't know how much he would have trained, but like, he like it, that's the, the probably it's, who can execute a game plan better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's already on the field. He's he's there coaching everyone whilst mm-hmm. he's at nine, and then just putting a few box kicks up. So no reason why you can't yeah. do that, mate. Any other, any closing thoughts on the podcast? Um, I'm trying to think. Do we need to cover anything else? We can get you back on. We can we can discuss. Um, I think even more coaching theory, especially youth coaching. I think that that might uh, be something I want to uh, on uh, a little avenue I'd like to go down. Yeah, I think um, I, I'll, summer might be good for that. So I'll be doing my capstone project, and I'm going to be put like my, my goal is to put together like a youth or, or high school specific to the states or at least what I've experienced from a, a like a structural point of view but like youth high school coach um, like essentially a, a coaching handbook yeah oh, well, okay. just like a, like, a, like a handbook and, and it'll nothing it'll be hopefully cover all sports so it'll nothing yeah. technical nothing tactical just how to create a an environment or psychologically informed environment and, and ensuring that again, first and foremost, especially if you're doing youth sports, 10, 12 year olds, like, you know, what are your yeah. goals and objectives and desired outcomes for, for these young adults? Cause if it's to win or for these young people, cause if it's to win games, like you are just fucking these kids. Right. Yeah, but, and, um, but, and you're not going to enjoy it either because no, hundred percent. So, so that's, that's everything and, and, and kind of the thing that's come up most in my, my studies and the research I've been doing is um, so it's, it's got a, it's a positive coaching sort of, I mean, it's positive right. coaching and athletic mm-hmm. leadership. So it's, it's, a, it's a ton of positive psychology theory um, being applied to, to coaching and leadership. And, and what they're seeing is just this reciprocal benefit of, you know, the, the, if you're coaching for the right reasons, like the, the, the joy and satisfaction that you as a coach get from watching your players enjoy themselves and thrive and, you know, become better players and better people. Right. So it's just this, this cycle of, um, of just like enhanced well-being that I think, you know, 
is is much needed in 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 youth sports yeah, um, i don't know if you saw it when you were out here it's quite toxic in the states right it's now it's the same in it's the uh, same in the UK. it's same in any country man and, like it's it's okay. it's not about the kids enjoying the sport it's about parents living vicariously through their mm. kids because they did not the, or they're either not any more playing actually most of them not if they're ones that live vicariously through their kids they're not doing anything sport wise like that because otherwise they wouldn't get so into it you know what i mean like if you're already doing your own sport you realize this is just a sport man it's just it's just something we do for fun oh. so yeah uh, i look forward I'm to getting push back. Doing that yeah. Podcast, mate. Go yeah on. Cause I was gonna say, i'll push i'll push back on you a little bit with that i think parents like being a parent myself like they just want what's best what, what's best for their kids and and as coaches and what will be built into this handbook is is parent education and so to your point on communication like if you don't you're if there right, are actually. gaps, if there are if there are perceived gaps in 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 goals, in development, in planning, in communication, parents are going to fill those gaps, and it's very rarely yeah. filled with the right shit. So no, okay. they're coming. That makes they're, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's kind of on us as coaches or, or administrators of athletic programs, like. What can you, to how do you use parents to, to the parents? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Use parents as your biggest asset, not a barrier. Once you educate yeah. them and you can, and it's not even like, because this conversation probably doesn't even happen once, let alone mm-hmm. every week as it should. And then they, they will, they'll come around. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, yeah. dude, this has been great. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, I look forward to having some chat with you about youth sports uh, in the future because yeah. that, that actually is, entertain- that's very interesting. I think um, once I get, get my I'll, I'll go my way through all the guests that i've got lined up we'll get you back on we'll talk youth sports we'll get we'll see about that that uh that handbook yeah sounds good mate appreciate you beautiful chatting with you mate take care yeah, you too all right